Who are you? I am Tamara Rojo. I am a ballerina and I am director of English National Ballet. How did you find dance? I found dance by accident. Um, my mother was a working mother um, and one day she arrived late to pick me up. It was a very wet day and one of the teachers of the school said to me to wait inside the gym because it will be warmer and they were doing ballet class and I had never seen ballet before and I fell completely in love with it. Your first breakthrough was uh, a gold medal. Can you tell us about that? Again, at the time it was a bit of a surprise. The ballet scene in, in Spain was very limited, um, so we were not exposed to what was happening internationally. I, um, there was a competition in Paris and um, my director wanted somebody to represent the company, but there were only two weeks left before the competition. Um, and I was the only one that raised her hand. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I think more curiosity than anything. I wanted to know who I was in the ballet world, where was my level, because it was very difficult to know, so isolated. Um, so almost without preparation, I went. Um, I never expected to win. Um, I just wanted to see where I sat. Um, and so it was a wonderful surprise, because winning that competition opened the world of ballet for me. And you were approached by the uh, Scottish National Ballet as a result. Galina Samsova was the director of the uh, Scottish Ballet and she was in the jury, so she was one of the members of the jury that gave me the gold medal. Um, and she offered me a contract as a principal ballerina. I was only 19 and I had never done classical ballet up until that point. So I did my first Swan Lake, my first Nutcracker, my first Sylphide and my first Romeo and Juliet in a Scottish ballet. And I am very grateful to Galina. She was incredibly generous and patient and to all the team there because they taught me how to be a ballerina, really. You have a reputation for being an incredibly brave, resilient dancer. And there are a number of uh, stories that have been widely publicised, one of which is uh, your replacing Darcy Bustle at the last moment because she was injured. Could you talk to us about that? Um, I guess I always felt I had no other choice. Um, I didn't come or belong to any of the institutions that had a big reputation in the ballet world. I didn't come from the schools like Paganova or Bolshoi or Paris Opera. Um, so I felt that every time a door opened I had to jump in. <laughs> um, and um, I guess to a certain extent I was fearless because I felt I didn't have much to lose. Huh? Um, so um, since, you know, it was just me. <laughs> So I was very lucky that I was offered the opportunity to replace Darcy because that translated eventually into a full-time contract with the Royal Ballet and I spent 12 years of my career there. So. But you were injured and you replaced an injured person and just continued nonetheless. Yes, you know, um, as I say, I felt it was an opportunity I couldn't, I couldn't say no to because you never know, they might not come around again. And there was also another, there's also another story of when you had a, a burst appendix in the middle of a performance, yeah. um, felt something pop as you would, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you continued. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I did go to the doctor before and he thought I had a tummy ache. So, you know, I, I, I went along. Um, I guess I have a high threshold but it's a story that makes me uncomfortable because I don't want other dancers to feel that, that they, they have to push to do this you know I I should have not done it um, I was very lucky uh, to survive I wish at the time I had listened to my body better um, so so there's there's plus and minus about being resilient you have worked with um, many unusual and famous names uh, both within uh, classical ballet and outside. And you have a reputation for really shaking up the English national ballet and dance overall. Um, 
Could you give us some examples? Akram Khan, for example. Um, I mean, I guess I try to bring to English National Ballet the people I admire, um, the people I enjoy watching, um, kind of what I feel to be the best. I think that is what I'm here to do. Um, Akram is an artist I've been following for many years as an audience member. Um, I love going to watch him dance. I love his choreography. I really admire him. And, and so from the beginning when I came as artistic director, he was one of the first people I contacted um, because I wanted to make sure that he would, um, he would come and, and be part of, of this journey in English National Ballet. Um, he's a very fascinating person um, to work with. Um, I love the whole process, um, all of the collaboration, how, to, uh, how he brings his whole team and all the dancers into the creation process. Um, so it's, it's been fantastic for, for myself as an artist, as a director, but also for the company. Um, I was also lucky to be able to bring Billy Forsythe, again, uh, a real extraordinary artist uh, of our art form. Um, and a fascinating, kind man. Um, so, yeah, I've been very lucky that those people I admire so much have agreed to, to work with me. Can you tell us some uh, about some of the uh, performances, for example, with um, Akram Khan, mm -hmm. lest, lest We Forget Dust, yeah. and also um, Akram Khan's uh, Giselle. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about them and uh, explain to the audience why they are so unusual? I guess um, they're unusual because they... He is a choreographer that had not really collaborated in a classical ballet context, that he had not worked in a classical ballet company. Um, for me, it seemed a natural thing to do because he came from a classical tradition of kata and he had transformed that tradition by mixing it with contemporary dance and by telling the stories that were very relevant to today, which in my opinion was kind of a very similar vision to the one I was trying to bring to English National Ballet. So for me, it was a, a marriage of, of visions and minds that was natural. Um, so the first project we did together was Dust. It was part of a, uh, of a mixed bill called uh, let, let, let's We Forget, um, that was to commemorate the 100 years of the First World War. Um, there were three choreographers, Liam Scarlett, Russell Malifan and Akram, and Akram did the last piece. And it was a piece very much about the figure of the woman, um, uh, the, the kind of the strength that the women um, uh, showed during the war, the fact that they had to step into the role of men, into the factories, into, um, into, the, the, um, into the land, um, and take over all, all those roles. And then the relationship of the men and the women when the men came back, and, and the women were strong and the men were, you know, broken. Um, so it was a beautiful work. Um, and it's a work that we have revisited now a few times. And, and that, that collaboration, it was a just over 20 minute piece, um, made me even more assured that, that we, I wanted to do a bigger project with Akram. And there was a, a classical ballet, a romantic ballet, the, the first big romantic ballet of, of our tradition, Giselle, that I believed um, could be seen in a new way. Um, I was partly inspired by uh, a film, Dancer in the Dark. Um, and, uh, and when I saw that film, with, uh, which was, uh, had uh, Bjork as the main actress, um, in my mind it was clear that she was Giselle and it was clear that that story was a way to, to tell Giselle. So I was looking for somebody that had the courage and the vision um, to tackle this story with both the understanding of, of the tradition but also uh, with a new voice. And, and after working uh, in Dust, it was obvious that Akram was, was the person. And yeah, I mean, he has 
uh, become the main work that represents the company internationally. He has opened um, incredible opportunities like performing at the Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow. Um, so it is a, a, a very important work for us. So could you tell us about the existing, the current projects um, for which people can buy tickets at the moment, if they're lucky, mm -hmm. and um, tell us a little bit about the future projects that people need to or ought to watch out for. So we are about to bring Bad Giselle to London um, after two years. Uh, we will be presenting it in Saldes Wells um, and I will be performing the role of Giselle there. Um, then we are going on tour around England with uh, Christopher Wilden Cinderella. Um, then we bring back one of the first uh, classical productions uh, brought to NMB, which is Le Corsair, also on tour and later in January in London. And then I'm very excited that uh, later on in January uh, we're celebrating 70 years of English National Ballet. So we're doing a big gala celebration, uh, visiting quite a lot of the repertoire of the past that is uh, part of our history and the dancers and the creators and choreographers that had been instrumental to our history. Um, I'm very excited about, about that. And then in the spring, Akram comes back for a new creation. Uh, he called it Creature. And it is based in, in kind of both the story of Frankenstein and Prometheus. But basically, we were discussing a lot uh, about the current uh, questions around the creation of artificial intelligence, the creation of life um, through all the ways that are possible today. And we believe that the same philosophical questions that were being asked when Frankenstein was first written about what is the role of man when he creates life. Are we gods? And if now we're creating a life that is superior to ourselves, will then become the other way around, they will be gods. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting subject uh, that we're going to be um, looking into. Do you have any plans to work with uh, artists, performers, even scientists, away from ballet to get inspiration to create other pieces of work? I mean, we work with a very big variety of, of people. Yes. Um, writers, um, we collaborate a lot with, in research with universities. Um, and I think the best thing about this new building is that it will allow us to bring in um, audience and children um, to see the creative process and to also uh, share their feedback. Uh, so I'm very excited about opening that process up to the general public and to children and students because I think it will be very interesting to see them respond uh, to a piece of work. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're uh, always looking to work with people that are unexpected. <laughs> Can you tell us about this amazing building in which we sit? Yeah. Well, we just move in. <laughs> Um, for 60 years, uh, English National Ballet was working in a space that was very limiting and very difficult because we didn't have one single studio the size of the stage. So if you can imagine, everything we create is for the stage, but we couldn't actually try it out until we were on the stage. Um, so I, I felt that I needed to, um, to give the company um, a space that could um, liberate it and could give it what I believe it deserved. Um, the dancers of English National Ballet worked very hard and they had very little in terms of um, supportive environment. So I'm very happy because this building was purposely built for us. It has four studios the size of a stage for the company, three for the school. We have a production studio where we'll be able to develop um, productions to, to the last detail with lighting, costume sets, everything before we take it on the road. We'll also be able to, uh, to invite other people uh, to, to, to create here. So we just had uh, Macintosh rehearsing the new Miserable. So that cross fertilization of the artists of English National Ballet and the artists from other kinds of art forms or the kinds of composers, of singers, of directors and writers, choreographers, 
everybody. I always saw this as, as this kind of pot with all of this creativity can mix and all these new possibilities can, can open up. Um, and of course we have what every dancer would wish today to have in terms of physiotherapy, gym, pilates, uh, rehab pool, proper changing rooms and all the things that we were never able to offer the dancers before. So it is an, an amazing building and, and for once I feel that I have a legacy uh, because the company can be here for the next 200 years. So, so um, how is the funding managed? I mean, you're a registered charity. Yeah. Um, how, how does that all work? Presumably you get some government funding, yeah. uh, you have foundations involved. Could you maybe talk to us a little bit about that? And also um, to maybe go into uh, and elaborate a little bit more why um, it's so important to have a broad base uh, in terms of the audience. Yeah. So we have kind of two separate um, um, needs, so we've had two separate needs. One was the building, the capital project, and one is the running cost of the company. So for the running cost of the company we receive a grant from the Arts Council and that represents about a third of our total budget. Another third comes in from audience, as in from ticket mm -hmm. sales. Um, so it's important that we are successful, it's important that we are relevant and that people are interested in the work we're doing. And then another third f comes from donors and foundations. Um, and I think that is a very good mix uh, because the, f the, the public funding gives you the safety net to be able to take risk to be able to give opportunities to young talent that hasn't been successful yet. Um, but the fact that you also have to be, um, you know, uh, doing art that is, uh, that people want to see um, and, that, uh, and that touches as, as many people as possible. Uh, and we're funded to tour, uh, so that's why we also tour around the UK. Um, and then, as I said, the, the last bit is, is, um, is the generosity of individuals and also some organizations and foundations. Um, the capital building was similar, although the public funding was a very small amount of the of the total um, of the total uh, cost. You've mentioned um, in the past that uh, the arts make a country, um, and also uh, how important it is. Uh, as part of our human story. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? I think when we think about any country, um, if I ask you what you think of Italy or what you think of Spain, what we're actually asking is what is the culture? Whether that is um, the food, um, the traditions, the music, um, um, the, 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 the stories, it is all culture. Uh, and that's why I mean that culture makes a country. It gives people identity, it gives them a sense of belonging, um, it gives them an opportunity to tell their stories. And that's a very basic need of humanity, to tell stories. It's how we evolve, it's how we learn, it's how our children learn who they are and who they want to be and what is right and what is not. And, um, so, so for me, it's, uh, it's very important that the arts are understood and they are protected uh, and they have an important place in everyone's life uh, because I genuinely think that they can make everyone's life better. So you're a very um, public-facing um, artist. Mm -hmm. um, you've had to go through an awful lot, overcome uh, a great deal of challenge to reach this point. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the rich connections you have made along your journey? The people you've connected with and in what sort of situations to help both your art move forward and um, your personal life, your personal human story? I mean, there are so many important people, so many people I am grateful to um, that have helped me achieve so many of my aspirations and dreams. And 
I feel like I will never have the time to say thank you to all of them. I think very important people in my life are my parents. Uh, I think they gave me the grounding, but also the support throughout my life to be what I wanted to be, which is an amazing privilege to have. Um, then I, I felt um, um, throughout my life I've met incredible people, people that have believed in me before I believed in myself. There was a very important man, Robert Wallace, who um, I'm, I met on a plane. Uh, he was a dancer that had become um, a, a lawyer and an investor. And, um, we discussed a lot about ballet and he told me, he was the first person to say to me, you should be an artistic director one day. And at the time I laughed, you know, <laughs> I, I thought it was crazy. <laughs> um, but later on again, he came into my life at a point where I was starting to think I wanted to do this. And he gave me a lot of advice. Um, Justin Bickel, who was the chairman of English National Ballet, who gave me uh, the opportunity of being the artistic director, was again a man that saw beyond what I could see, but also who understood um, the vision and supported it throughout. A man that has made it possible that we are in this building today. Um, but as I said, I've, I've had amazing, inspiring friendships. Nick Heiner is a very important figure in my life. Somebody I really trust and that has been very generous in his advice um, as, a, as a director himself. Um, Akram is a very important person. So yeah, I've been very, very lucky. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit, or well, you to talk a little bit about the support you have given female choreographers. <laughs> okay, yeah. As I explained before, I, I spent 20 years performing in England and I was never part of a, uh, of a commission uh, of a female choreographer. And as I became artistic director, I felt that that was not right. <laughs> there was something uh, amiss <laughs> um, because there was, you know, half the population voice was not represented on the stage. Um, so as soon as I could, I commissioned two mixed builds. She said, and she persisted. Um, and I commissioned wonderful women. Um, Annabel Lopez Ochoa, Asher Barton, Stina Quajever, who is a member of our company. Um, we brought in the uh, work by Pina Bausch. Um, and it has been wonderful. I mean, it has been wonderful to see also that there was a reaction from the rest of the industry and the ballet world, that suddenly everybody became aware of this issue and that the doors have become now open for female choreographers, that there are so many more opportunities now than 10 years ago. Um, and I think, you know, um, it's not that, obviously, I also commission men. Um, it, this is not a yes, question. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just that I do believe that the more um, variety of voices that we can see on the stage, whether those are men, women, whether they come from an Indian, Pakistani, um, African background, um, whether, you know, just the biggest variety of voices we can put on the stage, the better the art form will be. Um, we're here um, at um, the new headquarters of the English National Ballet. Um, this interview is being uh, recorded by uh, the Met Film students, um, future creators. Could you maybe give us um, some words of inspiration and advice for future creators and future innovators setting out um, on a journey to create something amazing? I think um, probably two things that I have learned that I hope might be useful. Um, one is be brave. Uh, I think no one ever um, regrets taking a chance, no matter what the result is. Uh, so be brave. And second, surround yourself with good people. 
people that want the best for you and do the same in return. Be a good friend. Uh, because, you know, we all have good days and bad days and in the good days everything is great. But in the bad days you need your friends <laughs> around and, uh, and you need to be a good friend to make sure they are going to be there when it's your turn. So I think those are the two things, just, you know, be courageous and, and be a good friend. You, um, during the everyday um, normal course of activities as artistic director of the ENB, uh, you meet incredible people. Who out of everybody that you haven't met so far, living or dead, oh, would you oh. like to meet? And what would you like to ask that person? Oh, that's a very difficult question. At first, I would love to meet Diaghilev, because he's a very inspiring figure for me. Mm -hmm. I would love to have a dinner uh, with him and have a proper conversation about ballet and ask him, what would you do next? <laughs> And the other person, and for very similar reasons, Nureyev. Um, I was just not lucky enough um, to, to be able to meet him personally or to work with him. And again, he was a transformational figure in our art form. Kenneth Macmillan too. <laughs> So three. I think I'm going to have like a, a wedding, <laughs> a dinner with so many people. But yeah, it'll be amazing to, you know, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to travel through um, history and, and ask all these people um, what they think? <laughs> As a final note, uh, before we say goodbye, could you talk to me and tell the audience as well about the project Der Lied von der Erde, mm -hmm. um, inspired by uh, Mahler's Der Lied von der Erde, uh, the song of the earth, and um, the message. Um, it was one of the first pieces of Kenneth Macmillan choreography that I had performed and it was one of the most moving experiences of my career. So I really wanted to bring it to the dancers of English National Ballet. It is a piece about loss uh, but also about hope and the meaning of life um, and the importance of those you love in life. Um, and it is a very quiet piece in a way, even though the music is huge. But the movement is, is kind of very detailed and very subtle. Um, and that makes the whole experience quite an introverted experience for an artist. It's, you're not talking to the audience, you're not even shouting, you're not even dancing for them in a way. It's, um, it's about um, an experience within and with your colleagues. Um, I was very, very lucky that the Deborah Macmillan, Kenneth Widow, agreed for us to perform it and to take it on tour around the UK because I wanted the audience outside of London to see it. Um, for me, it's a, it's, a, it's a very important piece of work. Um, and again, it was a piece of work that made me question what um, what the past is and what tradition is and who owns what culture. Um, because obviously uh, Mahler composed it at a very painful time in his own life. But it was based on, on poems, uh, on Chinese poems. And that was translated into German and then that was you know, a piece of work that then was interpreted by an English choreographer that took some inspiration from Japanese um, kabuki. And I love that. I love that suddenly there's a full new language that comes from all this cross um, fertilization of different cultures. Um, that if it's done with respect um, and with, the, with love, can, can be just extraordinary. Um, so again, it was um, something that I, I felt was appropriate for English National Ballet because we're a company of many traditions, of 21 nationalities, of many languages, many heritage, um, that we understand our history and our past, that we want to be relevant today and we want to build a future for our art form. So it was in a way a perfect piece for the company. 
Tamara Rojo, Artistic Director of the English National Ballet and Lead Principal Dancer. Thank you so much for your time. It's Thank been you. an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure is mine.